Have you ever thought about what pedagogy means and how it speaks to you as an educator? Today we're going to explore some groundbreaking ideas and practices in early childhood education. We're joined with Ashley Davis, who is an educator. She is passionate about the ECE field. She's an advocate, workshop presenter, and loves to talk about critical theory, pedagogy, and democratic education. Two powerful frameworks that challenge traditional teaching methods and advocate for justice, equity, and empowerment in the classroom. Together, we'll explore how these pedagogies inspire educators to rethink the power dynamics respect children's voices, and create spaces where children actively shape their own learning experiences. So stay tuned today as we dive into how we can embrace critical theory and different uh, values that can transform education and give children the advocacy that they deserve. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Happy to be here. So tell folks a little bit about yourself other than you're, you're an ECE lover. Tell folks a little bit about yourself and how you came to the field. Um, I've been in the field now in a variety of roles with children for a little over 10 years. I'm now a head coordinator of a post-secondary continuing education program um, with my bachelor's of ECE. Um, I grew up in the ECE field. My mom's also ECE, so I'm second gen ECE. <laughs> um, I started off working in recreational programming. I loved that, so I went forward with my ECE and worked in a few different settings, mostly with three to five. And then from there, I moved into uh, the post-secondary role and moved into doing workshops. And I really liked connecting with educators and still, still getting to interact with children in the field, but loved the new direction and role going into. Yeah. So I think as educators, a lot of times we go through these um, journeys, I guess, different levels in our in our career. And uh, I, I feel like I'm in that kind of that same space where doing different things, new things as I'm hitting the older years. Um, <laughs> so what really drew you to critical theory? What really like what was it for you? I think a big thing for me was some of the environments I was working in and seeing that uh, the there wasn't a dominant way that was going to work for all children and quite often saw in spaces children identifying they didn't see themselves in the room or seeing that families were feeling frustrated that their values weren't being met and that they were expected to adapt to the programs. Um, seeing just different conversations that were coming up and being ignored, things like children making comments on skin color and it being shot down as, oh, we can't talk about that, or conversations of religion and culture just being put as they're too young. And especially when I went back to school for my bachelor's, um, a lot of there's a lot of readings around those ideas of what does it mean in early childhood education to embrace the agency that children hold and recognizing that they are current citizens of society. They have an idea of what's happening around them. And if we don't give them the benefit that they're able to engage with certain topics, we're really doing them a disservice. And that really inspired me to go start talking more on critical theories. Uh, critical literacy theory has been one of the big ones I talk on. And it's kind of that opening start of what does it mean to have representation in your room and just seeing that difference that makes for many of the children. Wow, I love that. So let's dig, I like to dig deeper there. So explain to folks, what does that look like? You know, that, that literacy piece. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the critical literacy theory, one of the big things with it is recognizing that uh, your bookshelf as a whole speaks to values in your classroom individual books as well, but it's really looking at that whole bookshelf. And uh, for instance, it can be looking at culture, gender, ability, uh, take uh, sometimes with gender, a lot of books about boys. So like where the wild things are, it's a favorite book of mine. And it, you know, has Max, he's the wild thing. But if every single book shows boys as angry, the wild thing, you only see Max's, we start to tell children that all boys are Max. All boys are angry. This is how it, what it means to be a boy. And that same attitude goes into our bookshelf when it starts showing only one way to be a family. 
only one way to be a girl or a boy or only one culture as the dominant, one socioeconomic bracket. And the more we start looking at what our bookshelves tell the children, we also start noticing sometimes embedded um, discrimination in our media. So that might be where we realize, oh, actually all the books we have that feature a child with a different ability, um, it really highlights it from the angle of explaining to other children that it's okay to have a wheelchair or it's okay to have a hearing aid. But it, none of these books help the narration t for that child itself. Or we might see that there's uh, not any books that um, have children from certain backgrounds. And a big part of that is it's hard because if you look at the statistics of books, there's more talking animal books than a combination of characters who are black, indigenous, um, or Asian. It makes it a little bit of a challenge, but once we become aware of it, we're able to look at what that means in our settings. As a, as a child care director and owner, I have to tell you, we are very inclusionary at our program and very intentionally so, but it's, it's also hard to find those types of books because there aren't, you know, there isn't a plethora out there. So I, I, I think too, we need to call to authors to start to illustrate these books. Um, and the ones that I do find sometimes I find are stereotypical a little bit. Yeah. And again, so again, it's not intentional. And I can give an <laughs> example, you know, Cinco de Mayo, my teachers immediately as well meaning as, as they are, it's always a taco and a dancing around a sombrero hat, right? But they, because that's what they know, that's, you know, and so I, I think that, you know, these are conversations that definitely need to be had. Um, I'm a biracial um, and my mom is Italian and my, my dad is Cape Verdean. And so growing up, I'm, I'm a, quite a bit older. I grew up in the 70s and uh, there was not a lot of conversation about mixed family. It was almost like taboo at that time. Like, so now there is many, many blended families. And, and even just thinking about how you word things and just that intentionality of it. So another example would be at our program, we used to have uh, something called muffins with mom or donuts with dad. And now we've, you know, we've changed the verbiage around that because not, not everybody has a mom and some people have two moms, right? So being uh, intentional, and again, it's, a lot of times those are well-meaning thoughts of that just aren't thought all the way through. So I think we have to really have those conversations of how can we make sure that the words that we're using throughout our program, beyond the bookshop, but throughout the program, in the parent letter, in, the, in all of the invites, you know, are we intentional about making sure that it includes everyone, right? We're using the words family instead of parents, right? Because we've got so many grandparents now who are mm -hmm. helping step in, you know, to those roles or foster families and which we are one at, at our home here. And um, yeah, so there's, it's a great conversation to have. And I love that you're out there having these conversations with the greater EC community so that we all start really thinking about are we inclusive? Because we think we are. We're really proud that we like, we hang up the pictures and the posters and we were very well meaning. I mean, I don't think anybody in this field really doesn't really love community, but we mm -hmm. just have to be real more intentional about it. I guess that's what I think anyway. Yeah. And I think a really important thing you mentioned at the beginning there too, is that quite often it's not when it's missing, it's not because educators are hateful. It's not because they're uh, not wanting to, often the supply is a challenge. Um, I know like I have a good list of books my, for myself and some of them are hard to find. Some of them are ones where I'm not going to find them at a bigger chain bookstore or if I can find them, they might be very expensive. Um, and so you have to look then at those smaller bookstores, but even then it creates a high cost as well. And so if you have centers that maybe don't have the budget because a new book can be $25 yeah. and refilling up that bookshelf. And I think that's a big thing is quite often when things are missing in classrooms, it can automatically go on to the educators where it's, so oh, they're not doing a good enough job, but quite often it's, we're limited with what supplies we have and we can do the best of our abilities. 
utilizing yeah. things like libraries can be really helpful. Some though aren't feel comfortable using the library books because we know what little hands and books can sometimes end up like, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. And like you were saying, that intentionality is so huge. Yeah. Um, then the switching, I think the switching to families has become a lot more popular, which is wonderful to see, especially like you mentioned, foster families. It's one that quite often gets left out there. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways that we've been able to, to the best of our ability, we have books in the classroom, but then we have books that are in the office and we rotate them and share them. So even if you can find, you know, one book that's $25, you can leave that in a place where it can be rotated out to all of your classrooms. So it's not, you don't necessarily need to buy that same book for five different classrooms, but have a great variety. And, you know, you can keep it in a place where you can rotate it out, almost, almost be your own library, if you will. Mm. But yeah, um, so you bring up some really good points. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, you had also mentioned democratic education and how, how do those approaches shape the work that we do as educators? Hmm. And so when looking at like the democratic uh, educational practices, a really big thing uh, from it is that recognition of the agency children have within the room and within the space. And so quite often, I think in um, a bit more of a older version of education we'd seen was the idea that children were the sponges. They would absorb everything and we decided what filled that bucket. And so it would be like, we're learning about penguins. Why are we learning about penguins? Well, it's winter and in the winter we learn yeah. about penguins. <laughs> It'd be like, I want to talk about uh, this bug. Mm, bugs are for spring, not for penguin season. We go into those kind of stylings. Um, yeah. I think moving into more of a democratic practice where we do start to see um, and we're very much going into like that um, immersive curriculum where we do start to see, okay, what are the children actually interested in? What is their role in deciding what we're learning about and really getting us as educators to think too, why do we do the things that we're doing? Who is impacted by it? Who's involved in the thought process, the decision? Do we have multiple perspectives? multiple perspectives, um, including cultural perspectives, age perspectives, experience in the field perspectives, really looking at whose voices are molding the program. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I love to give children as much of a voice as possible. Um, and you're right, because it is very typical. And I, I joke about this a lot. I always say, there's more more fruit in uh, September than apples. <laughs> you know, I live in New England, so we're very, you know, very much about seasons and we, we love them and we embrace them. Um, but sometimes, as you said, you can get really hooked into, well, this is what we learn in this season. And, you know, maybe some of it is it comes from trying to connect what we're learning inside with what we see outside. So we're seeing snow. So that's really where that's based from. But I I know I live in Rhode Island. I haven't seen a penguin walk by my window ever in 54 years. So, you know, if, if that is your theory of why you're putting your curriculum that way, just make sure that it's meaningful and it really truly does represent what's happening in winter outside your window because it looks different in Florida than it does in Rhode Island or can exactly. I, you know Canada, right? Um, so going back to critical theory, can you um, talk to us a little bit about like that traditional power structures and education and how you see theory influencing classroom practices? Yeah. Yeah, and I think very much looking at that traditional idea of it, it's that teachers are the knowledge holders. We're supposed to be fully knowledgeable, whether it's a parent asking us a question, a child asking us a question. Um, we're meant to be the holders of knowledge and we decide what gets shared. And I think there's we're luckily seeing that approach change where we're not we're not the sole knowledge holders. We're not there to just decide what knowledge goes out to them. Rather, we're co-learners um, with the children. We co-learn alongside them. We're able to ask questions ourselves. We're able to not know the answer. We're able to discover answers together. And I think a really big thing with that mind switch also is, um, I remember reading from uh, Biesta, and he talks about the gift of teaching. And that it's not the teacher who gives the gift of teaching. It's the student who gives you the gift. because 
you don't learn from people that you don't like. You don't learn from someone that you don't want to learn from. If somebody doesn't respect you, they don't listen to you, you don't like them, you're not going to take anything away from them. But it's a gift that the student gives to you. And I think working with that mindset of how do I get that gift of teaching instead of how do I give that gift, it really starts thinking of, okay, well, for this child, for them to accept what I'm teaching them, I'm going to need to work with this and this. But for this child, this approach is going to work. And it really starts to get us thinking on that individual level as well with the children. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think um, you said a lot, of, a lot of great points there. So in terms of education, like how do you create a learning environment where children feel that their voices are valued and heard? Hmm. And I think it can be, it can be a tricky one because <laughs> there's not always, there's not always one way that's going to work or especially depending on what your setting looks like, what's the new style. I personally find that the immersive curriculum is a great way to start that process and that can be asking them those questions and instead of just giving them the answers, giving them a chance to discover. Um, I remember having some students who were very mad that someone stole an ice cube. The ice cube wasn't stolen, it melted. But yeah. instead of telling them that the ice cube melted, it was going to be, okay, well, let's figure this out together. What do we think happened? And instead of just giving them that answer, that moment. And I think as well, too, letting them know that permission that you're allowed to disagree. You're allowed to give your opinion. I love to read a book with children. It's the I Have a Right to Be a Child. And it talks all about the United Nations uh, Declaration of the Rights of the Child. And it tells them, one of the ones it says in it is, uh, I have the right to have my opinion, even if my mom doesn't like it, even if my dad doesn't like it, even if my teacher doesn't like it, I have the right to my voice. And I think once, it takes a bit, because for a lot of children, they may not be coming into the space with that mentality. Um, it takes a bit of space, but I think too, working with like pedagogical documentation, where we show the children we're paying attention to what they're learning. We show them, hey, I noticed this, this, and this happened. Let's talk about this moment. It starts showing them that we value their learning. We value what they're bringing into that space. Yeah, I think too, you know, going back to what you said, you know, um, with the teachers being able to ask questions, because let's face it, the last four or five years, have been a major shift in the way that we teach and the way that we interact with children. The children are different. Um, and for those of us who are in the classroom right now, they're, they're different for many reasons. The families are different. Like there are lots of things that have changed outside of what's considered traditional. And so we as educators might have questions because we might not know how to handle or uh, articulate or teach something that needs to be talked about. So I think, you know, as educators, we, we are all learning. And, we, you know, we always talk mm -hmm. about continued learning, but I think this has a new meaning in today's day and age of what, what that really looks like. 100%. And yeah, and I think it's educators feeling comfortable sitting with that and admitting, like being able to just simply say, you know, I'm actually not sure about that. Let me ask a few other people, even just to families, being able to say, you know, I actually don't know the answer to the question or I'm not sure it's not something I've encountered before. And it can be hard to be vulnerable in that position, especially with children. I've had it then where children go, why don't you know that? Or <laughs> uh, you can just Google it. Yeah. Or I had one child member say something to me, my brother is in grade five and he knows that. Why don't you know it? And it was, you know, <laughs> your brother in grade five is really smart. He's learning all about these right now. It's been a while since I've had to do uh, some more hardcore math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so funny. It kind of makes me think of, um, it's related, but it's not. But it is funny how much kids think we know everything. So in October, uh, it was Halloween and we had a student who came dressed as a superhero and her cape fell off and the teacher was trying to figure out how to put the cape back on and she looked at her and she said aren't you a teacher how come you don't know how to put it on <laughs> and the teacher was like a little like oh my god and i said to her your response should have been 
I'm a teacher, but I've never been a superhero. And so I've never had to put on a cape before. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed. She said, oh, God, that you're so quick with it. But, um, you know, it is interesting. And, and you think, you know, that teachers think that they need to know it all. You know who really everybody expects? Everybody expects administrators to know everything, yeah. right? Because if the teachers don't know, then they come to the admins. Admins don't know everything either. And we don't have all, we don't have it all figured out for this new world. So, you know, my directors that are out there listening, don't feel as though like, oh, why don't I, you know, why am I not thinking about, because it's new, it's new and it's not conversations that we've had before. So they're new conversations and we're all learning through the lens of, you know, a, a, a global perspective, I would say. Mm, that's yeah. one of the best advice I'd ever received from my mom about working in an administrative role is you have to be okay admitting when you've made a mistake or when you don't know the answer. Because quite often, if when we're in an administrative role, again, we feel that pressure or we just like, sometimes it's that, OK, well, I need to prove my worth of why am I in this role where it's no, no, I know that. And then it's going to be five minutes later Googling what is licensing say about this? But it's having that vulnerability does yeah. help in an administrative role and Absolutely. two for educators to understand we're also human. Yeah. Yeah, did you hear that, guys? <laughs> We've got a second on that, that we are also only human. Um, so let's think about, like, how does the democratic education challenge conventional teacher-student dynamics? Because there are some folks who are like, I'm the teacher, I do the lesson planning, this is what we're teaching, this is what I'm prepared for. So maybe talk a little bit about that and maybe even some shifts that you might have made in your own practice to reflect these changes? Hmm. I think a big thing it challenges is a very neoliberal form of education where the intention, what is the intention of education? Is the intention to have a perfect worker be? Or is the intention to give them the ability and skills to develop and find knowledge for themselves, those critical thinking skills? And very much when it goes into that neoliberal mindset, the teacher kind of has to be in that role of, I tell them what to do, I plan, because you're focused on, this is a mandated curriculum. These are mandated results that I need, therefore, this is what has to happen. And it kind of becomes a bit of a mic education system. The, would you like your education with a side of fries mentality of, it has to just be cookie cutter, it works for everyone, it's easy, we get through it. And I think moving away from that mindset, we do move out of a neoliberal set, which then kind of forces us to look, rethink what is the intention of being with these children. I know for myself in my own practices, one of the things to do that shift a bit was to have more conversation directly with the children to really pay attention to what they have to say. Um, and it started small where one of the first things I did was I started doing a question. I started writing out uh, their answers to questions um, when we would do our gathering time in the morning. So I would have like a question of the day and I'd write out everything that they said. Sometimes it would be a very short answer. Sometimes it would be very long, <laughs> but I noticed right away the children really liked it. Even the ones who didn't love to sit for gatherings, they liked to see their words written. They like to see that they were being listened to. And at the end of the day, they'd be showing their parents and be like, look, and they'd be like, Miss Ashley, can you read what this says and tell my mom what I said? And just moving into that perspective of getting their voices more heard. And I think looking at it from yourself as the educator, how can I hear their voices? How can I show them that I actually care about it? Yeah. So when you're when you're putting together a classroom because this might be like what some folks are thinking but when you're putting together a classroom and you try to have it be a little democratic how do you balance structure and freedom hmm i think one of the biggest things with it is that um democratic practice it doesn't mean it's a free-for-all or everything has to be a collaborative uh collaborative decision and that's where I think setting up the room is vital in any classroom. Um, as we know, your environment can change the whole way your classroom works. Setting up the environment in a way that can encourage children to be able to fluidly move around the spaces, but that still has 
you can still have those structured areas of in this space it's we can tell it's a quieter area in this space we can see there's a lot more room this is where more big body movements can occur or if um, depending on what kind of setups needed the circle mat or the tables where we have it more set out I think the environment can help uh, even if it gives a bit of a I don't want to say false illusion but it does give that element of choice but it's still crafted by the educators in the space to decide where things are going next to each other what's kind of more connected but it still gives that illusion of hey I do have choices in this space so let me ask this question and maybe it might just be a second part of what you just answered but how do we ensure that children's agency is respected while still meeting educational goals because at the end of the day we are set as educators to meet a standard or a specific outcomes hmm and I think that one it does get trickier because in some cases there is going to be those this is a mandate that I have to follow. It's a mandate that I have to get to. And it won't always fall into the desired uh, pedagogy. And I think that's one thing too for educators when you are faced with those mandates to give yourself a little bit of a break that you don't control the mandates. You can advocate for the change you want to see. You can... Um, let others know like, hey, this is what I think should be in place instead. But at the end of the day, you can't beat yourself up for following the mandates. <clears throat> Sorry. And sometimes that means that it may not match the practice fully that you want to see, but it's finding how can it still coexist? How can I uh, meet these mandates? And sometimes it is looking at, can this flow in naturally to what I'm doing? Other times, it's not going to fit nicely, but what can we do to make up for the fact that this one piece isn't working nicely? What can we do to still reinforce the agency that we want to see? Okay. Um, can you describe an experience where you saw a noticeable shift in the way that children engage with their learning when you apply either critical theory or democratic education? Yeah. I think on the critical uh, learning side, one of the first ones that stands out to me is um, I was working in a center where um, there was some conversations from children quite a bit on what can girls do, what can boys do. And I remember hearing from children, they were three and four, that girls can't do science. Math is for boys. And it was a very young age for that mentality to feel very set in their minds. And in that same breath, it would be boys can't play with this. Boys can't do dress up clothes. That's only for girls. And I found when we started moving in more materials that promoted different ideas around gender, different ideas around what does it mean and conversation with them too, where instead I, I stopped responding by saying like, you know, well, no, girls can do science too, to instead, how come you think that? Where have you heard that? Um, and going into examples too of, well, um, is counting? Counting's math, right? Well, we were doing counting outside together, remember? When we were seeing, well, how many of this? And they go, oh, okay. And I try and make those little connections with them and slowly could see their own language for some of them change where some of them would be more likely to say well no boys can play here too or or when they would hear the that's not for girls yes it is or i'd hear them go why and yeah. it was just seeing that when it was challenged a bit or there and then they were given multiple perspectives to see multiple discourses of what it means to be a boy or a girl their own perspective shifted and not for every child. It's not a miracle yeah. solution. There was still sure, definitely sure. ones who had those strong beliefs, but yeah. at least it was able to see, especially when it came to the girls saying science isn't for girls. Yeah. Seeing more of them then go, why? Yeah. And I think too, just seeing those every day, I love how you made that connection of we're just counting outside and you made that everyday connection for them. Cause it isn't really about this big, long, I don't want, I don't want to dumb it down, but you know, this big, long talk to a four-year-old, which is way above their comprehension. Mm -hmm. Like 
You counted today. Counting is math. When you're splitting the pizza with your friend, you're deciding who has more, who has less. Are we at, or do we have equal, right? So um, I love how you make those connections with real life experiences. Uh, I'd love to share one that happened um, on our playground a few months ago. And, you know, when we just talking about different family dynamics and the kids were playing out in the play yard and they started, they were playing house. And one of the girls said, I, I'm going to be the mom. And the other girl got upset. She said, well, I want to be the mom. And the third child said, and it was like the coolest teachable moment ever. The third child said, well, I'm not going to say the student's name, but so-and-so has two moms. So we can have two moms. And they literally played house. Nobody fought over who was the mom. And they both decided they were going to be the mom. And that was literally just from, that wasn't something the teacher taught. It was something that they saw every day in their classroom when we have a, a few families that have either two dads, two moms, and it was something the kids saw. And so immediately they were like, this is a thing that happens in real life. So again, wasn't a planned lesson. It came from the kids, from just observations that they saw in their daily daily lives, in their daily classrooms. Love so, it. And I think that yeah. really shows that importance too of children seeing more than just their own reality when they start yeah. being able to make those connections and yeah it's always the seeing children play family is always the fun one because you learn yeah. a lot about it where you'll get the arguments of well no yes. uh dad cooks in my house well no mom cooks in mine or i remember hearing from them well if if mom cooks in my house we order pizza <laughs> <laughs> i'm that mom <laughs> my husband is the best cook i am you know if my kids were acting me out i'd be constantly on a phone running here to there. Yeah, I'm that I'm that mom. Um, but yeah, it has been lovely talking to you. So before we wrap up, is there anything you'd really like to leave the listeners with to resonate or reflect on as we as we head on into our our evening? I think a big thing is if you're wanting to start looking at how can I embrace more of the children's agency and their learning, how can I grow my practice? Start embracing tension, learning the, to sit with uncomfortability, that to grow, you do need to encounter new experience. You need to encounter those uncomfortabilities. That's where knowledge grows and feeling comfortable sitting with those tensions, whether that tensions are sit with what's maybe not working in a room, maybe sitting with tensions that children are bringing in, but really sitting in those uncomfortabilities to work through them is a great step to building that agency within your room and really remembering that children are current members of society. They're not the future citizens of the world. They're current citizens. And reminding ourselves that as current citizens, they do have that agency and respect within their life. And they, they do bring so many things to our practice that we co-learn and exist with them. I think that is a great message and such an awesome segue. So for those of you who are listening, I'd like to say, if you'd like to continue learning, if you're passionate about staying ahead of the curve in teaching or in leadership, we've got something exciting just for you. We would love to invite you to join us at the 2025 Early Childhood Empowerment Conference on May 2nd and 3rd at the Crown Plaza in Warwick, Rhode Island. It's just minutes away from TF Green Airport, which is one of the easiest airports to travel to across the country. This event will feature powerful leadership tracks for administrators, innovative teaching sessions just like today, and support your teaching team with hands-on workshops that address today's challenges, not from 1950, but what we're dealing with today right now in our classrooms. We'll have over 50 vendors in our expo area. There is something for everyone. So tickets go on sale December 1st. You don't want to miss our early bird specials. Check out the link below for all the details and secure your spot today. And as always, remember, it's the small details that make a big impact on the success of your child care business. That's all. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.